Hey, John. Hello. Hey, John. Uh, it's, it's an honor to have you guys here, uh, to have, uh, uh, you know, Britain, UK represented here in Campus Party. And I think we have an announcement to make about this, right? You know, uh, the UK is a, is a country of innovation. It's a country, uh, especially the, the city of London is an international city. It's probably one of the most international cities in the world. Yeah, yeah. We have lots of, lots, of peop lots of young people, yeah. right? And not, nonetheless, it's also a beautiful city, also, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's a city that looks for the future, right? The, the um, UK is a country that looks for the future. So, uh, what, what can we tell about this? Well, Bruno, I, we have got an announcement to make, but before we say it, can I just say what a pleasure and a privilege it is uh, to be here. Uh, was part of the UK team, uh, supporting this event, uh, bringing people here as part of our UK Brazil season, uh, a season of events, more than 80 events in uh, cities around Brazil, seeing exchange of ideas, technology, creativity between the United Kingdom and Brazil. So it's great to be here. Yes, thank, thank you for our part from Campus Party for you guys to be here. Uh, it's, it's great that we can have this, this close relationship. Thank you. Uh, and what is, uh, is just so uh, exciting about today is the opportunity to announce uh, the, the really fantastic news that the next edition of the Campus Party uh, will happen uh, in September this year, September 2013, in our capital city in London. Thank you very much. Hey. And uh, uh, it's a huge uh, privilege and a great pleasure uh, to have the prospect of welcoming uh, the campus party uh, to London. Uh, and thank you very much for choosing London. I'm sure it'll be a fantastic success. Everybody's going to get very excited about it. And uh, we're ready to help in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's Thank you very much. It's great for us uh, to be able to announce that Campus Party Europe is going to happen in London this year. It's, uh, as I was saying before, London is not only London, but the whole uh, UK is a country of innovation. And I think we, we even have a representative here that, that we show us what innovation is all about, right? Well, we do. I mean, we have uh, a person who is an example of the fantastic uh, British great British creativity. Uh, uh, the person, uh, the co-founder of, of Raspberry Pi, and uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome and introduce Pete Lomas. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, pessoal, com vocês, Pete Lomas, da Raspberry Pi Foundation. Thank you. So, Pete, okay, we... before we start, what do you think about having Campus Party in London? Uh, well, actually, first of all, is that your first Campus Party? This is my first Campus Party. Okay, so what do you think about it and how it's interesting about bringing it in London? I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's just absolutely fantastic. The place is buzzing. And I don't need the extra espresso. I just need to walk around and suck the energy off all these people on the computers who are hacking the bits of electronics. It's just fantastic and so much, and just thank you so much for inviting me here and John for making it happen. And, and have you seen anyone using Raspberry Pi here? Yeah, I, um, I've seen a couple of Raspberry Pis about. I know there are a few more in the audience and so that was gonna be my first question. Who's got a Raspberry Pi in the audience? Yay! So we have got some. Okay. And hopefully after my talk, we might encourage people to have a few more. Okay, so that's your public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for welcoming me to San Paolo and Campus Party. The reception I've had already has been absolutely fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to presenting to you now about Raspberry Pi, how it started, 
the things that happened on the way in our first year in the wild and where it's going. So I know I'm not as famous as some of the presenters on the stage so I thought it might be a good idea just to give you an idea of my background. You realize from this slide that I was, I'm quite old because it was 1968 when I developed my first game and I did it with relays, capacitors and uniselectors and built it out of an old telephone exchange to play tic-tac-toe. But you all have to start somewhere. A bit later on, in 1977, I was a bit older. Computers didn't really exist then unless you made it yourself. And so I built my own Z80 computer the hard way, actually connecting the individual wires on the back to make the circuits. And that got me started on a career in electronics and I've been in that for 25 years helping people to take their ideas and their innovations through to finished product. So this is me in my day job. Now the guys in the office said to me, if you use that slide, we are going to put on the internet the picture of your real desk. So I said, okay, fair enough. That's what my desk really looks like. Now working with innovators and people who are trying to bring their products to market is a great opportunity to allow genius to actually rub off. And that brings me to my next slide. I'm sure you all know this guy if you've been on our forum. He is pivotal and the genius behind bringing the people together to make Raspberry Pi a reality. He had the idea at Cambridge University that we needed to do more to actually inspire people to get involved with computers and understand how they work. He saw a massive drop off in talent because the systems that people were using were closed and even now today they're even more closed and he needed a way of reopening the electronics so they could actually program it, they could see what was happening and they could deal with the issues that you get when you take the lid off an application and delve down into the soul of the machine. So this is an early Raspberry Pi. A very simple device, but it proved the concept that it could be done. For my involvement, it was a meeting at Imperial College that set me off down the track of Raspberry Pi. I was with Professor Alan Mycroft. I didn't know it at the time, he was just sat next to me. And then we walked through the park together. And Alan said to me, you know, we're having a real problem getting the students up to speed at Cambridge University. They don't seem to be hacking their computers anymore. So we looked at that and I said, yes, we've seen the same problem with people who are coming for engineering. Excuse me a second. And we tried to figure out why it was. And he said he had this guy at Cambridge called Eben Upton who had some ideas of how we might go about fixing the problem. So there was a trip to Cambridge, literally the week after. I met the guys and I was hooked. The concept was fantastic. So from there, we created the Raspberry Pi, Pi Foundation. And these are the, basically the trustees and the people who started it. 
was of course Eben, Alan Mycroft, Dave Braben, who you might know as responsible for programming Elite. Does anybody remember that program? A few. And Rob Mullins, Jack Lang, and myself. Our mission is to further the advancement of education, especially with computers and the things that go around computers. So we weren't just interested in the computers, we were also interested in what we call the related subjects. And that was a big push for me, being an engineer, because the related subject was electronics. And one of the big things that we brought to Raspberry Pi was the ability to connect other devices to the Raspberry Pi. So it's not just a computer, it has an interface that will take you on to other things. With all the closed systems that are about, the kids were certainly playing the games, they were certainly on the social media, but they were missing out on the fun of experimentation. The things that act the same, well, what if I try this? What if I change that? They weren't doing that, and we hope that Raspberry Pi will go some way to actually solving that problem. If you actually look, the problem is one of what Alan called activation energy. The amount of effort you need to get started. In schools, the ICT or the computer curriculum was based basically on typing to make pretty diagrams using the computer. That's not programming. It's not really even anything to do with computer science. And in fact, we found that Gove, who is uh, in our government, and Eric Smith, who you'll know for, from Google, said, to be honest, this curriculum is not fit for purpose. And almost immediately after that, they announced that it would be scrapped. The other problem is that overpackaged and fragile hardware, nobody is really going to start taking their MacBook Air to pieces to add a few interfaces or put Linux on it with a fear of being able to get Mac back on it later. And kids at home were scared to death because dad's over there, you're not taking my computer to pieces, you're not putting Linux on it, I need it for typing letters and things. So there's a digital divide between what the kids want to do and what they can actually do because they don't have the technology to do it. So, where did Raspberry Pi really start? Well, the answer is, there was a reporter from the BBC called Rory Kethlin Jones, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to him. He took an early prototype of Raspberry Pi and he put it on his blog. And he put on, with the blog, he put a little video and Dave Braben actually did the video and we thought, yeah, fantastic. Then I got a phone call off Eben about two days later. He said, hey, have you seen the number of hits on YouTube? 600,000 hits. It's about 850,000. So people are still going back and looking at this old original video. We realized then that maybe Raspberry Pi had some merit and had some traction. And I think Eben's phrase was, okay guys, we better get a shift on. And so we actually started really pushing the development. It was quite funny. The BBC had put 15 pounds. Now in the UK, that's also a weight. And a few people phoned and emailed in saying, why is this heavy computer going to be the next thing? And we thought, Rory, you really need to change that. 
So in June, June, July, we managed to get the Raspberry Pi site up. And this was the very first post. The important thing about that very first post, it also nailed our decisions to the masthead that we were going to deliver a Model A at $25 and a Model B at $35 out of the factory. At this point, we sort of had a prototype and this was it. The only problem was it used very expensive technology. The board was very expensive. It was bigger than we needed it, had a lot of features we didn't need, but it worked. It was a great development platform to test the concept of Raspberry Pi, but it was going to cost between $100 and $110. So we're in real trouble. So over the next three months, we worked like crazy to design the proper Raspberry Pi. We argued about all the features that Raspberry Pi might have, what we wanted to add, what we might have to leave out, and what the decisions we're going to have to make in order to get it to market at the price point that we knew it had to be. We also realized that we didn't have a logo, so we ran a logo competition. And I don't know about you guys, but Paul, who actually created this, it's inspired. It absolutely works for the Raspberry Pi. And the first thing that we sold on our website was Raspberry Pi stickers. And that gave us a very valuable amount of financing to continue because Raspberry Pi is a charity. It doesn't get any money from government. It only gets money from donations from people who support us and also from the trustees themselves. We have to thank Gordon Moore for the Raspberry Pi because he actually made the electronics industry press every two years to double the amount of transistors on a chip that you could get at a reasonable price. He said, this is my prediction of how it is based on what I've seen. So from right back in 1965, right up to 2010 with the Broadcom 2835 that has 100 million transistors, it gave us the platform that we needed to make Raspberry Pi a reality. We tried a couple of other processes before, but we couldn't get the price performance that we needed. There was either too many parts around the chip or the chip didn't go fast enough, or it didn't have the output display that we wanted to make it work. So let's very quickly have a look around the Raspberry Pi and what it's actually got. The core of the Raspberry Pi is obviously very important the Broadcom 2835. It has a 700 megahertz ARM11, which can be overclocked up to a gigahertz, if you're feeling brave. It has a floating point coprocessor, and most importantly, it has the video core for GPU right alongside, heavily connected into the ARM. So, the graphics capability is just fantastic. The Raspberry Pi can pl play full HD video in real time, downloaded off the internet, off of, or off a of server that you've got in your home. We decided that if this was going to be used as an educational computer, it would be really handy if you could wipe the memory and put it back to something standard really easily. And so we took the decision to use an SD card as the main program storage for the unit. And that meant that you could switch applications by just switching SD cards. I've got one at home and I think I have a stack of about 12 predefined SD cards to do different things. It works really well. 
we have had some problems with early SD cards not working with it but most of those have gone away now and we're getting pretty reliable operation across the range of SD cards. The biggest problem we had was that there was a lot of counterfeit SD cards that said they were 8 gigabytes and when you actually tried to format them they ran out after about one and a half. They were actually just fakes and that caused people a lot of problems. So with the processor and the benefit of Gordon's predictions by the time we got to launch we were able to uprate the memory from 256 megabytes up to 512 which has enabled a lot more applications to run on the Pi. We also have the Ethernet and also the USB that allows you to connect a mouse, a keyboard, a Wi-Fi. In some cases people will connect um, a hard disk or other things that they may have made. So it's our connecti connectivity option. It just means if you want to put a lot of things out there, you really need to use a powered hub. Power input for the Pi comes from a standard um, telephone jack for the micro USB connector and something like a 1000 milliamp um, plug in the wall will actually give you enough power to run the Pi and some of the accessories. Again, if you go mad, then you're going to need a bigger power supply. We also have an interface for the camera. Also over here, we have audio and video that will work on a legacy television. So if you don't have HDMI, or you want to connect just to a small screen and you want to take your own sound out of the system then it's there to allow you to do it. Now in essence the reason we can get to the price point is because Pi is very simple. It only has three real chips in it. The processor, the LAN which gives us the USBs and it gives us the internet connectivity through the Ethernet and also the memory. Add an SD card and you've got the full Raspberry Pi. Now here's one for the any of the is there any guys who like hacking hardware in the audience? Yes, no? A few. Or oh, very quickly. The thing about Raspberry Pi that actually made it possible is we took a standard PCB design and use this very clever little trick of using what's called blind wires. So signals from here only go down one layer. That meant that we can put components on the opposite side of the board so we could pack things really tightly underneath the processor and the memory because they sit as a little stack, which I'll show you in a second. It has a lot of power rails on the processor and the memory. And this is taken from my uh, diary of trying to figure out how we were going to wire it up. And eventually I worked out how to get all the wires to all the different power pins in the right order with enough decoupling to make the Pi robust. I must admit that was a really tricky part of the design. I took, I think, a hundred of these sheets on the train to Edinburgh and by the time I got back from Edinburgh with two trips on the train, I'd figured it out. Just to have a look inside the port board of the Raspberry Pi, this is the underside, which if you have a Pi, you'll recognize. And these are the layers inside that build up the power and connect everything together. And then on the top, you have the Raspberry Pi. And that's a populated completed product. In December we had the prototypes and Eben came up to Warrington to actually meet with me to get them commissioned and we found that we had a little problem. Through all the design checks and everything that we'd done we'd actually forgotten 
to connect one of the many power connections to the Broadcom chip. We'd actually left it floating. It was a heart-stopping moment because the boards didn't work. And we thought, oh no. Anyway, it turned out, and somebody obviously was looking out for us, that if you connect this piece of copper here to one of these pads that's right next to it, you can actually make that connection. And so we spent a happy day on the 23rd of December, scratching off the top of the copper and gluing on with a little solder those connections and then packing Eben back off to Cambridge to give it to all his developers the first Raspberry Pis. I have to say I was really glad when they phoned me up. I think it was it was Boxing Day, so the day after Christmas Day, the guys had been working on them over Christmas because that was the, for them the best present they'd ever had. They wanted to get them working. They phoned me and said, hey guys, it works, it boots Linux, I've got the ethernet running, I've got USB running, it's all good. So that meant that we could go for a launch. Now, while all this had been going on, we've sort of been talking about how many pies should we make? Well, we thought Cambridge University undergraduates, 300 undergraduates, would like to do that at Manchester as well. I'd like some, some of the modders would like some. I know, let's make a thousand. That'll be enough. Sounds like a plan. We should have really taken the signal from Rory's message when he got 600,000 hits. But we just, I guess, didn't believe it at that stage. I don't know whether we didn't believe it or we didn't want to believe the implications of what it was. Anyway, Evan, I've been having a look at the forum, I've been having a look at our website, been looking over the internet, and I got the dreaded call. Guys, we've got a problem. You know these units we're going to make, we need more. I said, that's okay. Well, everybody's put into the kitty to make the first 10,000. So all the trustees had actually given their own money and put it in the pot and said, there's the bits to buy the components to get the first ones assembled. Brilliant. He said, no, we've got a bigger problem. Okay, what's the problem? We can't get one of the chips? He said, no. The big problem is we need 200,000 and we need them now. So we are a charitable foundation with only the funds that we got from stickers and selling some of the prototypes on eBay, plus the money that we put in to actually build those 10,000 prototypes, what were we going to do? Well, when you need something like that, you have to look to the genius. So Eben, what are we going to do? And he says, simple, we'll license the design. And I know just the people to go and talk to. And in fact, I sort of half guessed when I was right, two of the big distributors in the UK, Premier Farnell and RS Allied, took on board the concept of Raspberry Pi and offered to make the numbers that we needed to satisfy the demand. And all they asked in return is they got a head start so they could recoup their investment and they didn't want to close off the design and they allowed us, once we'd launched, to give the schematics out. In fact, when they, we said to the guys, you do realise that this has sort of got a lot of interest and they go, yeah, 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 it's fine. We, if we've got it covered. I said, you've got your servers on hot stuff. Yeah, yeah, we've got it covered. It'll not be a problem. We're ready for it. So on launch day, 29th of February, ZDNet, Raspberry Pi, Buying Frenzy crashes website. It crashed both of them within about 20 minutes. They both had to go to static pages to route the traffic away from their main websites because their standard customers who were business people couldn't get on the site. 
In fact, the guys that work for me in my office came into my stuff. He said, what the hell have you done? We can't order parts off anybody. Oh, yeah, sorry guys. It was just a little bit more popular than we expected. In fact, it was so popular that we managed for a few hours to outtrend Lady Gaga. So we were really pleased with that, I think. Okay, so we've got the Raspberry Pi. People can start to get them. What can you do with this $35 computer that you have to put all the bits to and you have to make it work yourself? You actually have to put some energy in. Well, the answer, in my opinion, is anything you can think of, within reason, of course, with the computing power. It can be used in schools and hack clubs to program. It has enough power to run these applications, although we have got some work to do still to make them more efficient. You can connect it to robots and you can make the robots move under the command of the scratch, which is very attractive to young children because it's a programming engaged in the process of thinking for themselves, what happens if I do this? Wow, look what I've done. I've made this cat move. I've made this robot move. It's a small step, but from that small step, massive things can grow. For the lads in here, you'll also be aware that you can make your own brewery control system to make sure that your beer doesn't spoil. And interestingly, this works with an Arduino to do the low level and the Pi does the web serving so you can check on the process, progress of your beer from anywhere in the world, which is fairly useful. You can also make Pi mobile. These photographs were taken at a thing that we call a raspberry jam. I don't know how that's going to translate into Portuguese at all. But in essence, it's where people get together, a bit like campus party, but nothing like the volume. It's maybe just 10 or 20 people from a local area who get together and share their experience with Pi. I went to one in Manchester and the guys had these robots. They're a bit basic maybe, a bit Heath Robinson, but they work and people were enjoying playing with them. And they were learning things by playing with them and that is the most important thing. In May, after Pi had been launched, we realised people wanted to know, well what can you do with Pi? And these guys created a magazine called Magpie. And here's the first eight issues. Gives you all sorts of ideas in programming, connecting things to Raspberry Pi, things that people have done. It becomes a hard showcase of what people have achieved with Raspberry Pi. Because we want people to talk to each other. We want people to innovate together. We want people to actually become part of the ecosystem of Raspberry Pi. We also now have books. Eben has wrote the initial user guide and we have a getting started guide and most important just recently announced is we have an educational manual that's for use by teachers to help them in schools with the deployment of Raspberry Pi in the educational environment. So going back to what you can do, I think both Eben and me just really picked this because we really love this example. And I'm sorry I'm going to bore what people who may have heard this before. But these are guys who took a Raspberry Pi, a webcam, a helium balloon, and a lot of guts to let their rarefied Pi, because there weren't many about at that point, out into space and took these absolutely fantastic photographs. 
Now the thing I really love about this is not because they sent it to space at minus 50 degrees C and 1% atmosphere, which means the pie survives that, which is good to know. It was the fact that when my 10 year old saw these pictures, I said, hey, Arthur, come and look at this. He goes, wow, that is so cool. And then he says, but daddy, why is the sky black? And why is there a curve here? And we were able to talk for about half an hour about how the earth is constructed. And rather than me pushing that information to him, he sucked it out of me. And that's one of the great things that Raspberry Pi allows you to do. It allows you to turn around and flip the educational model on its head to allow the kids to ask the questions. And the problem is, the kids ask a few questions and they're way ahead of you. Give them a few hours on Raspberry Pi, they're showing me things that I didn't even know the Raspberry Pi can do. You can also, of course, make games. And the Raspberry Pi has a few projects involved with making arcades to run some of what we call the legacy games because we still absolutely love them. This one is a very simple ladder game but it's made out of hardware connected to the Raspberry Pi. How many people here play Minecraft? Oh, a few. Well, you may have heard that Minecraft is coming to Pi. But one of the beauties of the connection that Minecraft will have to Pi is you can drive it from a programming language. So you can make things inside Minecraft from a programming language. So we can say, okay, you can put the blocks together like this, but hey, look at this. You can write a program that will put the blocks together for you. And once it's put those blocks together, you can make it put more and it gets the kids into programming, into modding, and gets them away with the greatest adventure, in my opinion, of your life. Now, Raspberry Pi has an ecosystem. It has people who have created components that add to the functionality of Pi. So we have extensions, we have real-time clock modules, and we have a five megapixel camera which is due to be launched by the foundation within the next two quarters and will allow you to drop that onto the connector of Raspberry Pi and have high quality video and also really high quality stills. I can't compete with you guys, I'll try. You can have boards that fit on top of a Raspberry Pi that allow you to build bits of electronics. You can do it the simple way with connectors that you can just put using screw terminals or you can build it with solder and do a real hacking job. You can also get kits like the GERT board, either as kit form now and in fact you can get it made up or you can get an interface here that allows you to connect analog and digital things to your Pi. And then of course, with the ethernet, they could be web served across the world. So the connectivity gives you endless opportunities to create devices that become part of the internet of things. And we're really excited that Pi is being used in this way. You can also make cases, and there are lots of cases that have been designed for Pi already. This one we just love because it's Lego. Another creative system meets the Raspberry Pi, and also the guys used it as the case for the 64 Pi supercomputer. I know some people will argue maybe it isn't, but in terms of proving the concepts of how you connect processors to make a supercomputer, it just works. So here's some more cases. The kids absolutely love this one because it's being multicolored. 
and also this one because they can see inside and see what's going on. But Pi doesn't need a case. We encourage people to have it on the desktop so you can actually feel a connection to the thing that you're programming because you get more ownership. And we find that people who can connect with it are immensely proud of their achievements on a Pi over and above what they can do with a PC. They somehow think that on a PC there's somebody meddling in the background helping them to make it happen. But on a Pi they know they're doing every single bit themselves. So in December 12 we opened the Pi store. Well why open the store? It's quite simple. It allows people to get access to the applications that other people have written very easily. It gives us a method of disseminating and distributing applications and they can be either free, sorry, they can either be free or they can be paid. So if you invent a game for Raspberry Pi, you have a choice. You can give it to the community for free and see what people think. Or you can try and charge the community money for it and see what they think. And for sure, whichever way you do it, people will let you know what they think of your game. But it is an option to earn pocket money, a small amount of cash, by developing an application on Raspberry Pi and it helps to turn children into entrepreneurs. At the end of the day, you have to make money to survive. In January, bringing us almost up to today, there was an announcement that Google had actually donated the cash to allow us to purchase 15,000 Raspberry Pis to be distributed in the UK to schools to further our educational objectives. And it's absolutely brilliant. Now we just need to encourage other people to take the example of Google and help us to do that across the world and in Brazil. Anybody listening? We hope so. So for Raspberry Pi, where do we go next? Well, what would be nice, we'd like some staff because it's still being run by the volunteers. So we go home after a day at the office, we work all our weekends, we try and keep things moving. And at this point, I'd just like to have a very special mention to Liz Upton, who doesn't really get seen. If you're on the forums, you'd see her, but she's been absolutely instrumental in making Pi a success. She seems to work every hour that God sends and more, publishing things on the website, making sure that all our media and communications goes off as smoothly as it can do, making sure that if people need photographs they can get them, connecting people up across the world, generally documenting what happens and also keeping Eben in check all the way, the whole thing. So always thanks to Liz. And so we also would like an office because we're accumulating things and they're piled under people's desks. And that's something that we can now do because from the sale of the pies that we've had already, we get a small royalty that comes to the foundation that allows us to further our educational aims. And I have to say a million thank yous to all the people who bought a pie, has tried it, because a part of that money is going to the foundation to allow us to get from where we are now further on and where do we need to get to education in schools education in hat clubs jams and places like campus party and education in the home we had a rude awakening that education doesn't exist just in the classroom it's all around us the opportunities for learning at something like Campus Party are absolutely immense. And so we have to look in a broader sphere right across the whole demographic to places where Pi can help people learn 
about computers and about learning the techniques that you employ to make programs, to program the software, to make things better, to improve things, to innovate, and all the good stuff that I know that people here are trying to do every day. We also need the Model A, the one with no Ethernet, that is our $25 model. In many of our meetings we say, look guys, we need to get the $25 computer out there. We promised it, we nailed ourselves to the masthead saying that we were going to achieve this, we need to do it. And we go, yeah, but where are we going to get the chips from? Because Model B is selling quicker than we can make them and we have to give the people what they want. So hopefully in Q1 we will get to the point where we can have more pies on the shelf than the demand, at least momentarily, and we can now roll out Model A. And that's our goal. We need more capacity. We think, based on the chips that have gone into our manufacturing cycle, that we have sold about 750,000 pies. We really hope that it's first birthday, I can tell you that that's a million, and we have no reason to believe at the moment that is going to tail off anytime soon. We need better worldwide distribution and understanding about Pi. And so, one of the reasons why I'm here, and at the moment Eben is in the US, promoting Pi, getting people to understand that it is for everybody, it's a worldwide platform. We're working on incremental performance improvements to actually use the ARM11 to customize code on the Linux kernels to allow it to run faster. Anybody who got a Pi with the system when we first launched and get one with the latest releases, you'll find that the speed improvement is spectacular. Everybody asks, are you going to make a Pi 2? We didn't, when we started, really know we were going to make Pi 1 because our object was the education of children in computers and related subjects. It wasn't explicitly to make a single board computer. But that's where we went because it's where the need took us. And we also grew in the process a fantastic community that help us to further the aims of Pi, to help us debug the issues, to help us to take it on to the next step. So a new Pi, maybe it's not in the roadmap for 2013. We always think about it like we always thought about Pi, but that took six years to appear. It has to meet a need. And at the moment, our belief is that Raspberry Pi as it stands, coupled with the Model A, and maybe a few minor tweaks and improvements, has got a long way to run. And we would not want to, at any point, alienate the people who bought the pies already. It's a platform that can innovate, and so we're absolutely committed to maintaining the platform so that applications that run on the first version of Pi will run on the second, the third, and the fourth incarnation of this Pi. And maybe, as I say, 2014, 2015, maybe 16, we may do another Pi. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. And I'll now take any questions from the floor. Thank you. Ok pessoal, quem precisar de fazer perguntas em português, a gente vai fazer a tradução. Por favor, faça a pergunta no microfone. Se por acaso você for fazer a pergunta em inglês, avisa antes que ele precisa tirar o, ap o aparelhinho. This is for the translation, so if anyone asks in Portuguese, you can hear in English. Ok.
he's given us a hand with this. He's given us a hand with this on the. Uh, yeah, just, just put it like this, and you start getting the questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need to wear it the whole time. Uh, oi. Hi. É, eu tive na palestra do eu, ti, eu estive na palestra do Medog e comentei com ele que a empresa que eu estou trabalhando hoje utiliza Raspberry para a produção. A gente tem uma empresa pequena que coloca o Raspberry em no campo, é, em fazer em, em granjas que cuidam de frangos e a gente faz o controle dos sensores e transmitir isso pela internet. Oi, I guess it's better here. É, então, o que acontece? Eu conversei com o Medog e falei, olha Medog, eu uso Raspberry para produção. A gente tá, tem uma empresa que faz telemetria, que pega dados de, um, de uma granja que cuida de frangos e bota isso na internet e, o, e a pessoa que cuida, que tem a, a fazenda tem como ver se está tudo ok se está tudo certo e a gente fez a opção pelo Raspberry pelo preço e pela versatilidade dele e eu cheguei para ele e perguntei e aí, o pessoal do Raspberry, o que, que eles pensam no uso na indústria no comércio do Raspberry e uma coisa que eu já tinha ouvido falar é que é, o intuito inicial sempre foi educação, sempre foi ligado à educação. E, e aí eu, eu queria perguntar, que visão vocês têm disso, né, de, de uso para outros usos além da educação? Ok. Um, our primary purpose as a charitable foundation was in education. But obviously, if people use Raspberry Pi, get a little bit away from that box. Okay, sorry. If people use Raspberry Pi in industrial applications, it's important for them that they know that Raspberry Pi is not going to change, and there's going to be differences that they're going to then catch them out in their production. But also, we need to have the volume of Raspberry Pi to make sure that industrial use does not remove the pie from education. Once we can achieve that, we welcome the use of Raspberry Pi in an industrial environment and we will be looking at how we communicate what's happening in Raspberry Pi, both to our educational partners, to our modders, to our hackers, and also to people who might be using it for industrial purposes. Because they need to know if anything changes they need to know well in advance. But it creates a big long chain that then because it doesn't become terribly agile. So we have to look with our licensing partners how we can achieve that. But absolutely, because every Raspberry Pi that's sold to industry, a little bit of that cost helps us as the foundation to actually further our aims. So it will happen, but it's just still We're less than 11 months from launch. We're still a charitable foundation with now only one employee. We need to grow so we can grow into the industrial space. Alô. Vou perguntar em português, então. É, falando ainda do campo educacional, o Nicolas Negroponte é famoso pelo One Laptop Per Child é, nos Estados Unidos. Eu queria saber se houve algum tipo de aproximação para chegar no objetivo deles, que pelo que eu percebo é o mesmo objetivo de vocês com Raspberry Pi, só que no caso voltado também para o ensino da programação e dos acessórios que são conectados ao dispositivo. Okay, did everybody catch the question okay? I think, I think that our goal of having one pie per child would be fantastic, but I don't think we've set our sights that high. We're looking at getting as many pies as we can into the educational process, whether it is in schools, whether it is at home, 
or whether it is in hack spaces as I said before. I think the difference is that we're looking very much at the programming. So one laptop per child is a much broader educational remit to use that laptop to teach all sorts of other things. We're really trying with Raspberry Pi to focus on the programming and the connection of electronics. That doesn't mean it can't be used, but this is our first base goal, is to use it for programming. Vou fazer a pergunta em português. É, meu nome é Fernando Massanori, eu sou professor da FATEC. E eu dou aulas de introdução à programação para os alunos. E eu queria agradecer a sua presença aqui e dizer que eu fiquei impressionado, mais do que uma pergunta, uma, uma declaração assim, porque quando eu comecei a utilizar o Raspberry Pi para ensino de programação, eu pensei que eu tinha que fazer um monte de coisas de instalação, de comprar periféricos. Hoje eu utilizo o Raspberry Pi no lugar do meu notebook e eu não precisei instalar nada nele, porque eu acesso os slides via Moodle e dou as aulas usando o Python, que já vem inclusive com a biblioteca Pygame instalada. Então só agradecer e também queria perguntar se há muitos casos de uso para ensino de programação em universidade para cursos superiores ok I think um, and thank, thanks very much for your comments about Raspberry Pi one of our intentions with using the SD card was the ability to change environments very quickly. So once you unplug it, the Pi forgets what it was and it becomes something else when you plug a new one in. I don't believe that it will ever completely replace programming on big computers because there are some programming techniques and applications where you just need the power that those computers can deliver. If you're trying to do 3D animation, okay, you can do the graphics on the Pi. Whether the ARM would be up to doing all the computations that you might need to do, to do it, running in, in a, say, in an interpreted language, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. We're not there yet with it. When there are some examples of graphics that have been created using um, the arm to actually create, to create the vectors and then painting it on the screen in real time. So I think that Pi will be used less in the really higher education than at the grassroots to get your first introduction to programming. Having said that, I showed you an example of making a supercomputer using Raspberry Pi. It gives you all the basic components without the cost. I'm sure that it will be useful for networking. Uh, and John Mad Dog also says that it can be used, and I, I believe him, to almost do a full certification for Linux because it has all the necessary components. And you can create a Linux server with it, and you can have the Linux satellite systems. So it has a lot of opportunity. I suppose I should be very careful saying that Raspberry Pi cannot do something when the whole point of the Raspberry Pi theme for education is to never say something is impossible, never say something can't be done, because I know there's somebody out there in our community who'll go, there you go, I've done it. And we've seen that so many times already, where we thought, how is this possible? What a fantastic application, piece of code, piece of hardware. They've just done a brilliant job because they've taken the Pi, added their innovation, their concepts, and made something. Pessoal, a gente tem tempo para mais uma pergunta. We have one more 
acho. Ok. Ainda não, ainda não. Ok. Última pergunta? Não? Não? Então, beleza. Ok. Hey, Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. You're very welcome. Thank you. We've really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. And we expect to see you in London then. Absolutely. And I'll and be there. Gonna, and we're going to work this whole year to to get make sure that Hasbury Pie has a great presence in Camps Party. Thank you. Thank you. We're looking forward to it. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll go and give all this stuff back to your guys, yeah? Yes, that's fine. No, I think it's fine. Uh, there's a Yara singer right there. There's a person I want you to meet. So okay. I'm just going to say hello here real quick. Pessoal, queria agradecer a todo mundo pela presença. Muito obrigado. É, o Pete não vai ficar mais aqui um pouquinho. Eu queria pedir para todo mundo estar com, com o equipamento de tradução simultânea. Por favor, aproveitar o momento para devolver o aparelho de tradução simultânea.